Hey everyone, uh, this week we are learning about the Renaissance and the Reformation, otherwise known as the Protestant Reformation. Um, you only have four assignments this week. Uh, you have to fill in two sets of notes using the PowerPoints in these videos provided, um, and then do an online Canvas quiz for each of them. So there's only four assignments for this week. Make sure you get a head start and complete them all. We're going to look um, what this video is going to cover is just our first learning target uh, for this. It's I can define the word Renaissance and give three examples of changes that occur during this time period. When we um, take off on the Renaissance, where I want to point out is we are going back to Europe. Before spring break, you guys covered Native American empires um, and European exploration together. Um, the Renaissance is actually a time that happens before European exploration really kicks off, um, but we cover Native American empires and European exploration together. So we're looking at the European continent, and this is the Renaissance is the time that we officially end the Middle Ages, the terrible, awful Middle Ages, and we come into an area of time that's just more enlightened and better for some of the population, not all. Okay, um, if we were together, normally we kick this off by learning some Italian vocabulary. Uh, things like buongiorno, arrivederci, per favore, grazie, prego, mi scusi, tardi, ciao bella, uh, are things that we go over together because the Renaissance begins, guess where? In Italy. Um, so normally we have some fun with that. Make sure uh, you all go tell your mothers ciao bella, which means hello beautiful. Uh, in Italian and let them know how lovely you think they are. All right, hopefully you recognize these guys from your childhood, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, are named after the four great Renaissance artists and that was not like done on accident. Um, the reason why is because the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are what we would consider Renaissance men. They're all artists. Um, they're academics, they're good at martial arts, uh, and they're overwhelmingly smart guys. Um, so that's why they gave them the names, you know, Raphael, Donatello, Leonardo. They gave them the names of the great Renaissance artists. So the time period we're looking at is about 1350 to 1550. And the, the term, the big thing of our learning target, once again, is I can define the word Renaissance. The word Renaissance in Italian is the Italian word for rebirth. That is what that translates to, is rebirth. And what the Renaissance is, is a rebirth of Greek and Roman culture. So if you guys remember, you know, we had the fabulous Greeks, the fabulous Romans, and then we hit the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, we, we just were dumb in Europe. Uh, terrible, terrible fall of culture and civilization. Um, and so the Renaissance is about bringing back the amazing culture that we lost and looking to the Greeks and the Romans for inspiration of how to make everyone uh, more enlightened and intelligent. On your sheet that you are filling out, it talks about the characteristics um, of this. And you see these terms here. And we're going to talk about each one so you can fill it out. Uh, number one, it was an urban society. And an urban society means that the Renaissance was all about things that were happening in cities, not about things that were happening in the countryside. Um, so this is the famous city of Florence right here, the red roofs of Florence. That's the famous cathedral, the Duomo in Florence that everyone goes to visit and see. Um, so it was everything that was happening in the cities. It was urban. It was a secular viewpoint, and that's what this image is about. And that means that church and state were separate. It was a secular time because it wasn't a church-dominated time like the Middle Ages were. Remember, the Catholic Church ruled in the Middle Ages, um, and it's not going to have the same power. And we're recovering from 14th century disasters like the plague. Uh, the Renaissance is a time where we're finally getting over all of those terrible things that happened. The plague, the Inquisition, the Great Schism, the Hundred Years' War. We're getting over these tragedies and uh, looking ahead to a happier time. And then lastly, a new kind of man emerged, and that man is a Renaissance man. Um, this is a little meme. It's a joke. And a Renaissance man is somebody who is good at everything. They're painters. They're sculptors. They're academics. They're inventors. Um, they are truly people in this time period who have a gift for all arts and all academia. And that's what a Renaissance man is. We still use that term today to talk about people who are gifted in multiple areas. 
What you also need to know uh, about the Renaissance, the Renaissance only affects people that are wealthy. It only affects people that are wealthy. Majority of the population in Europe is still lower class. Um, and the Renaissance is only affecting people who are, you know, up on the higher end, the aristocratic groups. If you think about it, the Renaissance is going to be all about art, all about a rebirth of Greek and Roman art. Um, most famously, this is when Michelangelo paints the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Hopefully you've heard of that before. Um, and maybe you've seen images like this, the famous Sistine Chapel ceiling. You know, the center picture uh, is the famous one between heaven and earth, the touching of heaven and earth. Hopefully you've seen that image before. Um, but if you are poor and living in the countryside, you don't care that Michelangelo laid on his back for four years to paint the Sistine Chapel. What you care about is getting your next meal. So the Renaissance does not affect the poor population, only affects the wealthy. Once again, happens in Italy, Buongiorno. Uh, that's where it kicks off, the Renaissance kicks off in Italy, and it will spread throughout the rest of Europe. Um, but it takes place in three main city-states, and we have used that term city-state since we started with Greece, we learned about Athens and Sparta. And a city-state, once again, is a city that rules and controls the area that's around it. And in this case, that's Milan, Venice, and Florence are our three main city-states. This is where all the Renaissance action is happening. And we're going to talk about each city-state because you're going to have to fill out information about each one. This is on top of one of the most famous cathedrals in Milan um, that is built during this time. It's a Gothic style. Uh, cathedral. So Milan is the richest city-state um, because it has a trade and tax system. The Sforza family is the one that led the Renaissance in Milan. They are the ones that are paying painters and sculptors to make beautiful works of art uh, that are shown during the Renaissance. Um, but for Milan, you got to know about how wealthy it is because it is good for trade and good for tax. Milan is still one of the most popular uh, cities in Italy, and it is a fashion capital of the world. Florence is our next one, and that's the famous um, cathedral I showed you earlier, the Duomo. I've hiked to the top of it and stood right there and looked out over the whole city. It's really cool. Um, it is the most powerful city-state in northern Italy. And what I want you to kind of know about Florence, it is, is the Hollywood of the Renaissance. Like today, if you want to be famous, you go to L.A., you go to Hollywood. If you wanted to be a part of the Renaissance, you went to Florence. And it was ruled by the very powerful Medici family. Because remember, Italy is not unified um, like other countries are or kingdoms are. It's split up into these city-states. So the Medici family rules this one, uh, and they had a lot, a lot of money that they gave to a lot of painters to make beautiful works of art that are still there in Florence today. And if you go to Florence, that's what you do. You go to art museums, and you see all of the art that was done during the Renaissance. Um, this is where the Statue of David is as well, if you know that one. And then lastly, the famous city-state of Venice. Venice was built to be a trade hub, and it's, Venice is famous for having canals instead of streets. So, like, you don't get around by road. You get around by canal. Um, if you get on a taxi, it's a water taxi. It is not a, a car. And it's famous for these gondola rides, um, which crack me up because... American tourists pay like 80 euro, which is like 80 bucks to get in one of these little boats and get pushed around the canal for like 20, 30 minutes. Um, and it's disgusting because the water in Venice is so smelly and stinky because there's so much sewage in it. Uh, but anyway, this is a water taxi for what it looks like in Venice. See everybody lined up right here. Um, all these little stripes that you see here, the water taxis pull up right at the end. You walk across that ramp and you get on, and it's really cool. Uh, facts about Venice during this time period. Venice is the link between Asia and Western Europe. Boats from Venice come to, excuse me, boats from Asia come and dock in Venice, and they do business with um, Europeans, and then they sail back. The government was a republic, which means no king. Some people could vote. So there wasn't actually, like, one family that was in charge, like the other two city-states. And merchant aristocrats led the Renaissance there because merchants made all the money in Venice because merchants were traders, and Venice is all about trade. Um, trade made Venice the international power. So if you have one thing down about Venice, it is that it was a trade power. Okay? So those are our three city-states where all of our Renaissance action is happening. 
There's a famous book we have to talk about too with the Renaissance. Um, if you remember being in my room, I had a painting that a student did for me at the very front of the room that said it is better to be feared than loved. That is from this book. This book is by a guy named Niccolo Machiavelli. And there's a lot of things today that say like Machiavellian. Um, and if it says that, it's referring to this author and this book. It was one of the most influential works on political power that has ever been written in the history of the world. It explains how to acquire and keep power. Acquire means get. So how you get power and how you keep power. And he said in it that political activity should not be restricted by moral Christian principles. Bottom line, if you are going to be a ruler, you have to be ruthless. If you're going to be a ruler, you can't be a good person. Um, that's what he wrote about in The Prince. And one of his most famous quotes from that book are, We have not seen great things done in our time except by those who have been considered mean. The rest have failed. Examples like Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, um, Alexander the Great. Even though Alexander the Great was loved by his men, he was brutal to his enemies. Okay. Um, Alexander the Great, he said, was an excellent example of someone to follow of how to get political power. And he literally gave you a step-by-step -step chart of what you should do in order to gain political power. Okay. Um, so just please, for future reference, if you ever see anything about the book, The Prince, it's better to be feared than loved is the quote. And that is because if people love you, they will still overthrow you, but if they fear you, they will not. Okay, that's where that comes from. For those of you that have now recently gotten into the office, uh, Michael Scott has a field day with that quote too. Um, all right, so last couple minutes of the video point out here that Renaissance is all about artwork. So we are going to analyze two paintings. This is the first one. You can see it's very flat one-dimensional. Uh, the people and the dogs do not look realistic. The sky and the trees do not look realistic. You know that these people are at the back of the painting um, because they are higher up. Uh, it's so That's once again not 3D, it's 1D. Um, and it just it doesn't look very lifelike. Compared to this painting, three-dimensional, there's perspective that gives you that three dimension. The sky looks real, the people look real, their poses are very dramatic, the body parts on them look uh, very, very real. So this is a medieval painting and this is a renaissance painting. The difference between the two, and, and this is more, you know, like Greek and Roman, um, they had figured this out where in the Middle Ages we went backwards and we had lost the ability to do wonderful sculptures and wonderful, wonderful paintings. Um, but medieval artwork was just did not look good uh, versus Renaissance artwork was amazing and, and pieces that still hold the test of time. So this is by Raphael. It's called School of Athens. Once again, this is a rebirth of Greek and Roman culture. And the name of this painting is School of Athens, one of the most famous Greek city states. Um, but you're going to compare the two and you're on your assignment. What you have um, is I'm, I'm going to let you in your own PowerPoint kind of go through some of the famous works of Donatello, Michelangelo. There's the uh, Statue of the David and the Pieta, uh, the Sistine Chapel of Michelangelo. You know, there's Da Vinci, his famous Last Supper painting, the Mona Lisa, one of his most famous, his inventions. Raphael, famous for the painting I just showed you, the School of Athens, Betrothal of a Virgin, um, the dome comparisons, the Duomo in Florence versus what we copied in our U.S. Capitol. Uh, but what you're going to do is you're going to go through these paintings here, and you are going to decide whether you think it is medieval or Renaissance. Is it three-dimensional or is it flat? Um, the other big thing that's a dead giveaway the Renaissance embraces nudity because the Greeks and Romans celebrated the human body in the Middle Ages. It was considered a sin to show any skin, so you had to be very, very covered up. And artwork in that time, obviously, then was very covered up. But if you see nudity, it's automatically going to be the Renaissance. If things look flat, not one dimensional, or um, one dimensional, not real, it's going to be medieval. Okay, so that's the other part of your assignment. So you're going to be filling this out, turning this in to me, and then there's the end uh, where you are deciding whether it's Renaissance or Medieval. 
Hopefully you've got the big concept. Thanks so much. See you soon.